Dale got in the bidding, and nobody else jumped in to compete. Uh -huh. You ended up paying not much more than you pay for a brand new Harley Davidson. Bingo, wheel sue time magic. Because this not only is a, a Survivor original paint machine in glorious shape, it's also a one family bike. We've got all the original paperwork. Here is this. Uh, was that a minute ago? This is the original registration for uh, uh, Barco Miller in Suttersville, Westminster County, Pennsylvania in uh, 1920. Uh, it's a one family bike, it's a, a survivor. Now, it gets better. The reason they looked at the carburetor and left is the carburetor is a Shiver racing carburetor that the factory paid big money to develop and they only put them on their racing machines. Only on their racing machines. The story gets better. This is in fact a 1919 racing motor. It's got the narrow cases, it's got big valves, it's a quarter inch narrower than the standard bike that was sold in 1919. That's also a 19 model. And they only made 12 of them. <laughs> that makes it special. Then the story gets better. This bike is a racing, factory racing bike, but it's got a full electric kit, front and rear electric lights. It's got a Claxton horn. It's got the King B, the King B spotlight. It's got a Corbin Speedo, the road seat, a luggage rack, and a toolbox. Every accessory that Harley sold except the passenger pillion in 1919. So original bike, one family bike, racing bike set up for the road and it's not a question of who had it it's a question of what mr or who mr miller knew in harley to convince them to sell what became the fastest bike in south pennsylvania had to be the fastest bike on the road in 1919 really great story and then of course the fact that that he got it essentially for a song now, a lot of folks ask you know what are these motorcycles worth well uh, there's a machine up here that we took to Pebble Beach last year. It's a, a 29 factory racer, one of the eight valve, one of the eight valve racers. They made 29 of them. Milwaukee has, I think, three. We have five of them, two of them in dirt track racers, two of them in hill climb uh, uh, livery with the stretch frames and big, big sprockets, and one extra motor, number 17. We don't know where the original frame and, and the sheet metal is, but we've got an extra motor. And when we won second place at Pebble Beach with that bike, Jay Leno came over to talk to Dale and congratulate him. And he asked three times in five minutes if the bike was for sale. Three times. <laughs> and a machine like this is, you know, equally valuable simply because of the, the special characteristics. And so this is new since you were here last year. Now, what's a, uh, is this just, they just worn the tires? And they're just worn out. They're just, yeah, just worn out. It, but the bike doesn't have much mileage on it. It's 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 tight in every component. Uh, Eighty-five year old uh, or 80, uh, 90 year old tires just are have given up the ghost. Although Dale is convinced that they might hold air, I don't think so. <laughs> but you never know. There's the uh, sidecar. Yeah, the sidecar uh, rig out front is a 30, uh, 32 VL. I drove that all last year to uh, 75th uh, uh, anniversary uh, Parkway events. And the tires on there are about 70 years old. My goodness. And so, you know, I ran 35, 40 miles an hour and, and did just fine. Put about 1,000 miles on the bike. The tires are still looking good. Drive them. You know, Bert Murno came to Bonneville in 1967 with a 1920 Indian Scout and worn out tires. And he literally he carved them with a pocket knife and used shoe black on them and then ran 190 miles an hour. He did. He did. He really did that. Oh, shit. It's really great. Put the seat. Now I'm, I'm confused. Who's been here before and who hasn't? Y'all. Okay, we've been here. Okay, and y'all. World's rarest motorcycle. Oh really? Let me tell the story. Uh, if you Google up the world's rarest motorcycle, this motorcycle right there comes up nine times out of ten. Really fantastic story. Uh, the machine was uh, in a, an apartment building in Chicago, uh, a block full of apartments that were cookie cutter, you know, uh, uh, row house apartments were being torn down. And uh, put that down so I don't lose it. Uh, they came to this one building, and the dining room was four feet short. And they tore down a wall, and in behind that wall was this bike was wrapped up in sailcloth. Fluids were drained, tires were empty of air, and it sits exactly like you see it right now. We know it's a 1960 model because of the Bosch carburetor, a Bosch uh, Magneta, which is a one-year-only Magneta. It's uh, the year after they changed it significantly. Same thing with the carb. The other two pieces that are non-trob are the tires and the rims, which you can buy from a jobber. 
virtually everything else he made. The machine is way sophisticated, way ahead of its time. It's got, for example, a cure for the business of having to choke your machine and, and uh, give it three prime kicks when it's cold or cool. Uh, Mr. Traub wanted to be able to start his bike right away, so he pulled out his syringe of gas and gave each one of the plugs a shot of gas and didn't have to worry about priming it to do it himself. It uh, was probably a bike that was a work in progress for whatever reason it was put behind the wall. It's got the mounts for a headlight, and as carefully as the bike was put away, there was no headlight found with it. It's got a rear luggage rack that appears to be set up for a, a situation like this for an extra pillion for a rider because it's got the foot pegs, but the pillion is not there. Maybe a work in progress. The uh, most we well, and the bike so the bike came out of the wall in '67. Uh, Everybody's seen the movie, or most motorcyclists have seen the movie, The Great Escape, and think that Steve McQueen made that fantastic jump over the chain link fence, uh, escaping from the Nazis in the, in the film. Actually, Steve McQueen didn't make the jump. His buddy, a uh, fellow named MD, Bud MD, his lifelong friend, tuner, co-racer, uh, they, were, they were partners in everything they did. He actually made the stunt jump, and this machine went into his collection. And the two of them turned the motorcycle world upside down for 25 years trying to find out who Traub was which makes the bike really unique in terms of rarest that really may or may not be debatable. But if you put it in the broader context of the time, it gets real interesting. Before World War I, there were over 240 manufacturers of motorcycles in the United States of America. If you wanted to be in the motorcycle business, like these folks in Elkhart, Indiana, you went down to the bike shop, which was the happening place in town. Wilbur and Orville Wright ring any bells. They ran a bike shop. They were pretty inventive guys. Get your frame, go to the sheet metal shop, and get your sheet metal made up and your fenders. Get your bike shop to make you up a you know, saddle and get your handlebars. Go down to the uh, saddle and light company and buy yourself a Columbia Auto gas lamp kit, put it on your bike. Call up Thor uh, uh, Motor Company, and Thor Motors were in a lot of American motorcycles, and order up your machine, put your name on it, and advertise, and you're in business and 240 odd different enterprises did. Thor doesn't appear in any, and we've looked, and, I, and it's not just a solo effort. Nobody has found any information about who this guy was. And he's clearly proud of his machine. He put his name on here five times, twice on the sheet metal and three times in the metal work. So he had to have access to, not the mag in the car, but a foundry and a really excellent machine shop, a tin shop, uh, 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 a leather shop. He did all of this work apparently on his own. And the bike is way ahead of its time in a number of ways. Uh, one thing was the, uh, uh, the business to get around having to prime your, prime your engine to start it. Another overcame a problem that all of the early bikes that had constant loss oil systems face, and that is having a wet sump. You get oil around your flywheels, you get enough of it around your flywheels, performance goes into the basement. He cured this 20 years before Harley cured it. There's another story about the introduction of the, of the EL, the overhead valve recirculating motor that really is the grandfather of all Harley motors today that's right next door here. He put a pair of baffles on either side of his flywheels that were adjusted, had screw adjustments. If you're going out for a short ride, you could leave them set low. Oil would accumulate behind those dams. You get home, you turn the petcocks and drain the oil out. No wet sump problems. If you're going on a longer ride, you run them way up so that it'll accumulate a lot more oil, and you get home and you drain them out, and you have no wet sumping problems. Another thing that he did that was really inventive is the business of, of he's got a three-speed transmission with two neutral positions, and there's a positive detent for every gear. If you've ever driven a transmission with some wear on it, whether it's a Model T or a motorcycle, going up a gear with, in, with low RPMs and have it pop out of gear, it's a royal pain in the neck. This bike doesn't come out of gear. He used leaf spring front suspension, something that Indian did, a lot of the old timers say that these front ends like this and on the 1940 Indian up here and several of the other, other machines at that period, a lot of people claim that that's better than either the Springer or the telescopic forks. It gave a better road ride and control than any front end on any American motorcycle ever. Proof of the pudding, he made everything about the motorcycle, including the full tool kit. We got the rest of these put away, but this fits nothing else in the museum except this head bolt right here and it was made in his shop to fit this machine, this machine only. World's rarest motorcycle, maybe, maybe not. It's a great story nonetheless. And then the, the final bit is, and I don't start this because it's Dale's, and if he blows up a million dollar motorcycle, it's, it's his machine and not mine, but it's got a, an 80 cubic inch low rumble that uh, 
what's the saying? The Japanese love to hate and have yet to emulate. <laughs> Done about 100 years ago. So. Yeah. Candidate for the world's rarest motorcycle? Maybe, maybe not. This machine right here is, is equally good. We know who made this, unlike the Traub. Uh, you all probably know the story about the collaboration that led to the founding of the, Hin of the uh, Indian motorcycle uh, business. Uh, uh, George Hendy was a famous bicycle racer in the 19th century. He was a national champion a number of times in the 1880s and, er and early 1890s. His biggest gripe was that the pace machines that were early motorcycles would break down halfway around the velodrome. And here you got 75 bicyclists all humped up on the back of this pace machine and it suddenly quits and everybody goes all over the track and the race starts ruined. Well, he got together with this uh, engineer from Connecticut named Oscar Hedstrom and they made three prototypes in 01 and then in 02 they went into full production making Indian motorcycles, made about 150 machines. Then in 03, and this is the oldest machine in our collection, is that's a model from the third, uh, third year of production. They made 450 odd motorcycles, and that's an 03 model. So in terms of rarity, this is one of a kind unknown. This machine was made in the Indian shops at Springfield before Hedstrom left Hindi. They had a tiff over how to run the company. Uh, um, Hindi wanted to get out of the business, turn it over to a board of directors, and let a corporate board make decisions about how to run the motorcycle company. And eventually that's what happened. And a lot of people think that running a motorcycle company by corporate decision-making process is the pits. And in fact, 1953 saw the end of it for India. Whereas the Harley and the Davidson families managed to do rather well over the last hundred years, with the small exception of the, the AMC years when they sold out for a while, but then got back in business. This machine is unique because there are a number of features that not only were they doubled up as with the electrical systems and the brakes and shifting operation, uh, this was, it had features on it that was never offered to the public. Uh, most importantly, overhead valves, they never offered that in any production machine ever. Indian went out of business making flathead side valves and they never did this. So in terms of rarity, we know who did this one. This is Oscar Hedson's dream in the shop after work. This is Mr. or Mrs. Traub, we don't know which, and we don't know who they were. What's, which is the most rare one. My newest motorcycle in my own modest collection is a 46 Indian Chief. I'd go for the Indian, because I can get parts. I'd have to make them for the Indian. <laughs> so, this bike makes also a great story. We collectively have a real di direct connection with the story that's told about internal combustion engines. The Smithsonian has an automobile called the Whippet, and they make a lot of smoke and gas about the Whippet being the first internal combustion engine to go across the continental United States in 1906, the first. Well, that's wrong. We collectively own the machine, it's ours, Smithsonian, right? And we are telling the wrong story. In fact, George Wyman rode this Yale, California powered, uh, engine powered uh, bike across the United States in 1905, one year before they made it across on four wheels. And we know the story very well. It's been documented. Uh, he got to within 50 miles of New York City, had terminal engine failure, and he had to pedal the last 20 or 25 miles. So technically, they're telling it right in Washington. But for my money, I'd say this was the first internal combustion engine to go across the country. And we know pieces of the story very well. He was halfway across the country, in fact, when he stopped in St. Louis to see this man back here, Henry Louis Flesher. Uh, again, he had trouble. He went to the most inventive place in St. Louis, the bike shop. Orville and Wilbur Wright doing pretty interesting things in bike shops. He looked up Henry Louis Flesher. They fi fixed whatever the problem was, and he left. Henry Louis Flesher caught the motorcycle fever. He built 12 motorcycles between about 1909 and 1914. That's one of them right here behind you. And the story gets really rich because Dale had found this machine. He'd had it in the collection for a, a number of years. And we were in here one afternoon, and a kid came up and said, you got Grandpa's motorcycle over there on a box. The Flesher family knew all about Grandpa Flesher, but they didn't have any of his machinery. And so they sent us, very kindly, all this information about Henry Louis Flesher and his love affair with motorcycles that was born when George Wyman stopped in 1905 and said, hey, you run a bike shop. I need some help. Can you help me? <laughs> so... You know, what's the world's rarest motorcycle? There's only two or three of these known. And uh, we're doing a, doing a production right now on, on our website. We're starting some machines that we don't pull down and normally
necessarily start as frequently as some of the others. And we started this one last week that hadn't been run in five or six years. A little gas and change on the change up on the spark plug and uh, it uh, lit up and been around the parking lot several times. <laughs> what, the world's rarest motorcycle? Anybody ride sidecars? You ever ridden a sidecar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, when you ride a sidecar, you know you got to power through the curves. Unless you've got a 1917 Dayton that articulates with its sidecar mm -hmm. so that you can ride the motorcycle like a motorcycle and your passenger can sit very handsomely, nice and cool and calm and collected in the sidecar. So they made, they made motorcycles, they made sewing machines, they made this cycle wheel over here, that's also a Dayton. And we had a bicycle, one of their bikes here, somebody's moved it, but uh, uh, that's probably the finest original paint Dayton. There are a few others known that are in pieces or partially put back together. Thank God nobody's gone to the trouble to restore them because they're only original once. The whole business of, uh, of uh, intrinsic value as a model of what was actually done is really in place when they are unrestored. So we like to, like to see them like that. So, some of the stories. Every machine in here has a story. The, uh, uh, how many of you have ever seen a horizontally opposed part England and the UK because if you look at the profile of this, all the weight is down low. A guy named Freddie Dixon owned every record on the continent and in UK from about 20 to about 26. Harley liked the idea a lot. Indian did as well. Indian tried 125cc, the Model O, in 1916 and 17. They sold almost none of them. They were underpowered. The riders just didn't respond and they went off the market. They're scarce as instinct. Harley got the bug, and they decided to try essentially the same thing, and they made a 600cc variant. The motorcycle was amply powered. It's in, the Douglas folks sold their fore and aft horizontally opposed machines, and, and they built them as the vibrationless motorcycle. And I get on my 600cc on a regular basis and ride 20 miles, and it's, I mean, I'm not 18 and take my hands off the but the bike, it just tracks and rides like a dream. This machine is something the same way. I, I'm really fond of that English machinery, although Dale likes the American stuff. But uh, I've, I've been to UK a couple of times and, and ridden in a couple of their antique meets. And I belong to the London Douglas Motorcycle Owners Club. And the president of the club, there's not, it's not a big group of people. The president of the club is a, a rather dapper fellow. Dapper really fits Chris. He dresses up in period costume. He's this big, tall, 6'5 guy, and he puts on, you know, his tweeds and bow ties and spats and let, and goes in. He usually wins the best period dress at these meets. Well, we got Chris over here for a visit to the U.S. He and his wife had never been. I had him up to Boone, and I put him on my Jeep, and she in the sidecar, and sent him out for a ride on the parkway, and they had a glorious time manhandling a foot shift and doing just fine for most of the day. And they came down to the museum, and so we got this bike out to put Chris on, the American, fore and aft, horizontally opposed motorcycle. He made a couple of rounds around the museum. And I had his video camera. And so he said, well, take a shot of me if you will, Bob. Make sure you get a good shot, Bob. And so I got him coming around the corner, up the hill here at the back of the museum, and I said, oh my God, everybody run. A crazy limey is riding a foot shift. Get out of the way. Well, I thought it might offend his rather dapper presence, but in fact, his buddies back home like that clip better than anything else that he shot me with. Here comes a limey on a foot shift. 